Hey friends, my name is Zamir and welcome to the second episode of Perspectives on Campus. If you know me, you know that I love the orientation program at Western. It is now my third year on the team. It is my second year sharing a house with Softs. But as much as I've enjoyed my experience, I don't know how much I love the institution that is orientation. And that's because I don't see myself adequately represented. On my soft team this year, for example, I am just one of six brown folk. And I'm thinking about it and I think that's honestly some of the best representation I have seen in a really long time. And that's really unfortunate. Although we're seeing this issue at Western, I wanna be abundantly clear that this is an issue that is widespread and it, it can be seen across our province and across our country at large. In fact, there are studies that are, that are really confirming the existence of a participation gap on campus between racialized folk and their white counterparts, as well as between socioeconomically advantaged versus disadvantaged students. I think when it comes to why racialized folk aren't getting involved in co-curricular experiences, it might be because of issues related to income. Um, we've seen since the 90s that middle class and upper class students are more likely to get involved on campus than their working class counterparts. And a visible minority, whether or not they were born Canadian, um, is likely to earn 87.4 cents to their white Canadian counterparts. Co-curriculars take money and a lot of our racialized students just don't have the disposable income required to participate in the first place. Um, I think that's one potential barrier, but there's so many more. Today, I am really trying to get to the bottom of this and trying to see what we can do to really encourage um, and support our racialized peers getting involved in student life. So I've invited two amazing student leaders from Western. Whoop, that's a lie, they're from McMaster. Um, the first of which is Sarah Tamjidi, the Director of um, Diversity Services at the McMaster Student Union, as well as Blessing Brown, who is the Assistant Director, and she also founded McMaster's first BSA last year. I'm so excited to hear from them, and I'm so excited to get to the bottom of this, hopefully. Hi, Sarah and Blessing, how are you guys? Doing well. Good, thanks. I'm good, thanks. And thank you for joining us today. Um, in today's episode, I really want to learn more about how we can make student life more accessible for racialized students. And I know you both have so much expertise um, in your experiences um, at McMaster. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. So, I like to stay involved in student life at Western and one thing I have really noticed in my involvement is that racialized communities and students are disproportionately underrepresented in our student associations, on our clubs, in Greek life, um, and I think a whole host of elements kind of produce the conditions which make this to be the case. Um, racialized students are more likely to be financially insecure, the nature of a lot of our campus infrastructure is often inaccessible. Students often don't feel desired by or represented by their student life and their clubs and so forth. Um, and the list really does go on. Um, Blessing, I know that these are some of the issues that you tried to tackle when you founded the Master's first ever Black Student Association last year. What did you find the roadblocks uh, to students um, getting involved on campus life to be? So one of the major roadblocks that we wanted to combat with our organization was lack of information. So within um, my first year friend group and others that I knew, um, a lot of our information came from upper year, third and fourth year students that we knew. So that was how we were able to access most of the opportunities that we did in first year and beyond. So with the Black Students Association, we wanted to connect those students who not have those third and fourth year allies with other Black students, as well as create opportunities to, for students to connect with other organizations that were focused on Black groups that they may not have been able to connect to. Another uh, roadblock that we wanted to combat was lack of opportunities. Within the Black Students Association, we wanted to create opportunities as well as connect students to other opportunities that existed for Black students. 
that were within the McMaster community as well as within the community at large. That to me really takes me back that, you know, McMaster only got its first Black Student Association last year in 2019. My friend groups, um, we came in expecting to connect with that. That was where we wanted to land as first year students. And the fact that that wasn't there at McMaster, I think was a surprise, especially hearing from our other friends at other universities. So I think that's what really gave us the push to start to find, to found the Black Students Association. Um, and as well, having those third and fourth year allies really helped us with um, even trying to like put it like even finding it possible to put together as second year students. From a student union perspective, Sarah, you've been involved with the MFU since your first year. Have you identified similar barriers? I definitely have. I've been involved with our student union um, and the different services since I was in first year, as you just mentioned. Um, and I've always felt like I've been navigating a very white centric space um, where most of the people that I would interact with were white most of the folks that we would sort of service within our our different like groups that we would help out or get en engagement from were white folks and so it definitely felt othering for me specifically and so um, I definitely understood that coming into this role as the director of diversity that we sort of wanted to address this othering and sort of um, navigate within a very, very white centric space, how do we create a space that is very um, open and sort of like, I guess, communicable for folks of color on campus? Clearly we need to do a much better job of informing racialized students um, of opportunities on campus and making sure that they're aware that they are wanted in our student life experiences. I'm just wondering, how do we do that though, especially in a way that is not bordering on tokenization? Um, I feel like you'd really be able to tell us from a club's perspective blessing and you'd be able to tell us from a student association, Sarah. Yeah, I think the main thing is engaging students in first year. I feel like your experience in first year really sets the tone for the rest of your undergrad experience. So if we're able to come in and set that tone where McMaster is diverse and we're welcoming and students can engage in those opportunities, I think it would make a really big difference. And I think um, to, just to add on, engagement comes from students sort of seeing themselves within the services or clubs or initiatives that they want to get involved in. And so the symptom of the problem is that students don't want to engage and don't want to get involved. But at the root of the problem is that students don't see themselves as um, being either capable, being worthy of uh, applying or even getting involved or just seeing themselves as, as or seeing that as something that is even possible for them. Um, so that is really the barrier I feel like is what is that's stopping students from really getting involved. I don't think everyone understands that in our campus communities. Um, for example, there's a professor at Brock, um, his name is Thomas Hudlicky, and he recently published um, an opinion essay where he wrote that, and I, I wanna quote it, so I'll read it. Um, he wrote that hiring practices that suggest or even mandate equality in terms of absolute numbers of people in specific subgroups have been influenced to the point where the candidate's inclusion in one of the preferred social groups may override his or her qualifications. How do we respond to comments like that? Yeah, honestly, hearing stuff like that sort of makes me laugh just a little bit because I can understand where the professor is sort of frustrated and feeling that, oh, well, someone's skills won't be the main factor of why they're hired. But again, we have to sort of look back at that's the symptom of the problem. What is the root of the problem? And you know, what I've identified is that, like, let's look at it from a perspective of what sort of opportunities did their privilege as a white cis man give them to get to a position like this that their um, colleagues of color sort of were not given. And so how were they given these opportunities that allow them to get to a space like this where they can look back at, at, at other folks who weren't given these space, these opportunities or given like the benefit of the doubt that they can do a great job without having um, a ton of sort of experiences or things under their belt when in like this case this professor probably had a lot of those throughout his life so again I feel like it's again the whole symptom of the problem this is the sort of essay opinion piece that a professor would write without looking at who is really being affected by this. 
um, and really looking at how students are going to be most affected by all of this. Since again, if you don't see yourself represented in your professors in academia and your teaching assistants, how can you see yourself as someone who wants to get involved, um, to get a PhD, to become a professor, to do research, et cetera, et cetera. To be clear, a lack of representation is just one of the many elements that discourage racialized students from getting involved in co-curricular experiences on campus. For a student to be involved in campus life, it's very helpful for them to have a flexible work schedule and be in a comfortable financial situation as well. And there are studies, uh, I read one in uh, Voices in Urban Education, which quite literally prove this. Um, on top of that, we do know that a racial wage gap exists in Canada. So perhaps racialized students often just don't have the financial security that's helpful when getting involved on campus. So I can speak to that from even personal experience. So as uh, my parents who immigrated to Canada, they didn't really have a lot of knowledge on like our, our SPs or our ESPs. So I personally didn't have one coming into university like a lot of my um, white counterparts did. So in order to fund my education, a big part of that had to come from either OSAP or working. And as someone who opted to work over getting uh, student loans, I found that it was a really big challenge balancing um, student, um, balancing my personal life, education, as well as work, much less getting involved on campus. So I feel like I had to sacrifice a lot of opportunities um, in order to work and be able to fund my education, which is what's most important. Thank you for sharing Blessing. And being involved in co-curriculars often sets a student apart when they're applying for grad school or when they're discussing their experiences at a job interview. How can we ensure that racialized and socioeconomically disadvantaged students aren't put in a bad place, for lack of a better word, for not having the monetary resources required to get involved on campus? Um, I know when I think about it, I often think about if OSAP is calculated um, not just based on tuition and academic fees and costs, but also based on the understanding that students should be getting involved in their campus communities. Well, I think one big way to kind of combat this is to expose students to opportunities where they're able to both be involved in campus and develop these professional skills and make money. So like this opportunity, for instance, as an example, so in the MSU Diversity Service, as a director and assistant director, we're able to be paid to work and also gain those opportunities and skills that would help us in the future for other opportunities, as well as in our professional life. I think another big thing for this is scholarships. I know it's commonly like said and people just always like turn the other way when the people mention scholarships, but I don't think people understand how much scholarships go unused, unapplied to. For instance, I know a friend who was able to gain a $500 scholarship just by writing an article for a company based on leadership. It wasn't even a scholarship based on a merit or anything like that. She literally just had to write an article for a company and she, she got $500. So I think kind of honing that fact that scholarships are still available for students at all levels is another big way to combat that. I think those are all really great points. Um, the other I think just to speak on is that it's, it's really up to students um, to tell their universities and to hold them accountable for lack of better words of what they're yeah. sort of falling short of doing. So if we're talking about scholarships, why don't students know that these scholarships exist? If we're talking about, so Blessing and I are fortunate enough to be paid in our position, our execs and our volunteers or not. Um, and this is the case for many folks who are doing similar work um, to us on campus. And so all of these are sort of missed opportunities that the that the school has to address systemic issues that could help uplift students of color for sure. Especially at McMaster, I have been seeing a lot of students really vocalize the changes they want to see in the campus community. And my only thing that I've ever sort of hoped that the university would sort of take into account is that uh, you're servicing your students like this university is meant to sort of benefit the students who are coming in um, and seeking an education and when there are systems in place that cause this great inequity how can you if, how can you expect all of your students to benefit and all of your students to shine yeah absolutely and you know what thank you so much sarah and blessing for sharing all those recommendations i think they are very very helpful and i think they're especially useful because you guys have been heavily involved in student life on campus. So you know firsthand, in addition to whatever you may have read or researched, um, about what we can do to really improve the system. So thank you both so much for sharing and for joining us today. Thanks for having me.
Of course. Before we sign off, do um, you guys have any words for our racialized friends out there who are watching this and wondering if student life is for them? I would recommend that students, if you see a problem, just address it. If there's something that you find that your campus is lacking in terms of student life, you start that conversation, you engage the campus, you engage your campus on addressing those issues. So I would say the students have a lot more power than they use on campus. So I would recommend that every student take advantage of that opportunity. I want to echo the same thing that students have way more power um, over their school's policies and over um, sort of the decisions that their school makes. And so if you have an issue with something, if you want your voice heard, it will be heard. It's louder than you think. To quote one of my favorite student associations, students have the power to change the world. As cheesy as that sounds, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we definitely can, you know, make changes in our local communities. I think we just need to continue to mobilize and continue to speak up. Um, and, you know, to everyone watching, thanks so much for joining, for participating in this narrative with us. And we will see you next week.